Hi, I'm Jean Shafroff and I'm on a mission. Anyone can be a philanthropist. My television show came from my book, Successful Philanthropy, How to Make a Life by What You Give. Won't you join me? Welcome to Successful Philanthropy. I'm your host, Jean Shafferall. This show is designed to highlight the work of philanthropic leaders here in the United States and then beyond. Today's show, all about politics, but politics is giving. With us, Town Supervisor of Southampton, Jay Schneiderman. Let's all welcome Jay. Jay, my first question to you is, what exactly is a town supervisor or the town supervisor? Sure. Well, first, Jean, great to see you. I wish in person, but we'll, I'll take Zoom for now till we get through this pandemic. And thank you for having me on. Um, so a town supervisor is sort of the CEO and the CFO, the chief executive officer and the chief fiscal officer for a, a, a municipality or a township. So Southampton has about 60,000 people. Um, population. In the summer, it, it gets much larger, probably 200,000 or more people in the summer. And the supervisor prepares all the budgets. The supervisor is the head administrator for the town. The supervisor runs all the town board meetings. So there's a council of five members, uh, myself included. So I chair, uh, chair those meetings. And uh, the towns do all kinds of things from uh, repaving the roads, to running amazing parks, to running senior programs. Um, there's so many different aspects of, of life, all well, the planning department, building department, um, the clerk's office, all, all those things. So many different things that town government does. And some people might not even be aware of all that we do, but uh, it's a big operation, an important one, because people care about you know, the party, the loud party next door, or, or are they building a shopping center down the block? Or what are you going to do about all the traffic and the airport noise and all those things? They all, you know, they all come to me. So, you know, it's, it's a really important position. And it, an exciting one for you, I'm sure, plus a lot of work. Now, Jay, our biggest issue this year and last year really has been this COVID-19 pandemic. And you as town supervisor, how have you handled this? And what's going on right now here in uh, Southampton and on the Eastern end of Long Island? Are we getting vaccines out fast enough? What are you doing to ensure that everyone is safe? Thank you. So, you know, there's no, you know, I can't reach on the shelf and pull down a book that says, here's what you do when there's a pandemic. There's no such book. So this, in spite of the 20 years or more that I've been in elected office, um, there's no playbook. There's no preparation for something like this. The town of Southampton has been in a local state of emergency for a year now. Unbelievable. And uh, we have worked around the clock, I mean, literally nonstop trying to keep people safe. You know, in the early days, it was distributing masks and other personal protective equipment. It was modifying workspaces with plexiglass and thermal scanners and um, closing offices like, uh, you know, like the senior centers and reducing operations at the beaches, sometimes shutting things down entirely. Beginning, you know, we didn't understand how it was spread um, as much as we do today. And so we were extremely cautious and we did everything we could to protect people. You know, a year later, government is functioning. We are trying to keep up with everything. A lot of people are working from home uh, when they can. Uh, we've made so many different things electronic, so you don't even have to come to town hall. Like if you want your beat sticker, you used to have to you know, come to one of the offices to get it. Uh, now you just go online and you can get it. You can even talk to a building inspector from the comfort of your home and share documents like we're doing on Zoom. Um, we have put pretty much everything online and even the town board meetings are, are online. And there's some positive things going on. First of all, the numbers have come down from the height. You know, after Christmas and New Year's, it was really, you know, frightening. 
the numbers have come down, but they're still you know, every day in the town of Southampton, there's still about 20 new positive cases. Uh, you know, each day it should be coming down now as more and more people get vaccinated. We've been setting up pop-up vaccine sites. We did lots of testing and we still have a testing site. Um, but uh, starting next week, the state is setting up a vaccination, a full-time vaccination center. I'm really excited about it. It's going to be at Stony Brook, Southampton, the, the college there. And uh, right where the voting booth was, if well, maybe you guys, maybe in East Hampton, voted in a different place. But uh, it's a building I think most people are familiar with, right across from uh, Shinnecock Hills Golf Course. And, uh, you know, we're going to vaccinate an awful lot of people. A thousand people a day will get vaccinated at that site. And we're working really hard with the state to open that next week. And, uh, you know, more and more people are becoming eligible. They lowered it to 60 now, 60 years of age. And uh, I suspect that will continue to change. That'll get you know, more and more people will be eligible. And we're going to, I want Southampton to be the first town to have all of its residents vaccinated. So uh, we're really, we're really pushing hard with vaccinations. Which I think is uh, very important right now. And I'm glad to hear that there will be one spot where people can go. And so now we are just about entering uh, spring. And by say May 1st, where do you think we'll be as a town and then as a country in this battle against COVID? Do you see things really changing? Do you think that the numbers will be down dramatically? And as we start summer, what do you predict? Well, I think by May, most people will have been vaccinated. Though it does take, you know, 30 days in some cases and even longer. So, you, you know, Moderna, you, it's basically a month before your second shot and then another two weeks to get the full um, protection. Pfizer, it's a three week waiting time. The Johnson & Johnson, it's just a one shot. But I think by May, most people will have been vaccinated. Most people will have that second shot, will have what they refer to as herd immunity. But I still think that we'll be watching the numbers carefully. If there are no cases on Long Island or no cases out uh, in Suffolk County, I think things will open up quite a bit. Will we still wear masks? I, I think in certain instances, yes, we'll still be wearing masks. But I think other than that, life will return largely to normal. And when we do get a positive case, we'll, we'll go back to cont um, contact tracing, which is something that's sort of been suspended. So as soon as one person becomes symptomatic, we'll be, hopefully it won't spread because of all the people who are vaccinated. Uh, it's got no place to go, but we'll be able to track down those people who might have been exposed and make sure it doesn't go any further. So I'm hoping by Memorial Day, certainly, you do see a return to the, the Hamptons, maybe with, a, uh, maybe with some mask wearing, but uh, I think it's going to be significantly um, closer to normal. It's kind of like a new normal. Right, a new normal. But I think people are longing to be together again. They're longing for that social intimacy, to hug their friends, to sit down with a group of people. We've spent so much screen time through this pandemic, so much time on our computers and our iPhones and our TVs and streaming this or that. I think we're longing for human interaction. So I think you're going to see... Um, a lot of smaller types of events. Uh, I think a lot of arts and culture, a lot of arts and culture, music. Uh, I think that we'll continue to relax the outdoor dining. So I think anyone who wants to do outdoor dining, I, I think that's been a great part of the pandemic, seeing people sitting outdoors, enjoying a, one of our great restaurants in the area. So I think you're gonna see a relaxation of those rules that continue. And a bunch of other changes. I think uh, we'll still use Zoom for things. Um, you know, it cuts back on traffic and it makes things easier. So I think that uh, there'll be some things that develop during this pandemic that I think will be here with us after that are positive things. Yes, and I think we're going to see a huge influx of people coming into the Hamptons because anyone who's a city dweller will want to be out of the city and out in the fresh air. And 
with our spectacular beaches and everything that the Hamptons has to offer, I think we'll see a lot of people. And I think that's a good thing because I think people are really ready. That being said, I also like you feel that we need to be very, very cautious still because although many people will be vaccinated, there will be a number of people who won't be vaccinated. And just because we have more um, vaccinations in progress and almost maybe most people vaccinated, it doesn't mean that we can't still get COVID. And so what about the big parties? As someone very involved in philanthropy and, and you as a great supporter of philanthropy, are we going to have the big outdoor parties? I'm on the board of the Southampton Hospital Association. What I've heard is that the hospital is going to continue with the tiny parties this year and then next year have a big one. Uh, what are your thoughts on outdoor gatherings, large ones right. so for I'm, this summer? No, great question. And I'm you know, watching to see what some of the larger events um, plan on doing, like the Hampton Classic. I, I don't know what the plan is yet for the Hampton Classic or the hospital party party that you mentioned. My guess is the really big parties, the really big events will not happen this summer, that they will be pushed off till next summer. And you'll see mid, small and mid-sized events, events with like 300 people, not events with 3,000 people. So, uh, and I think it's, will they, will they be allowed? It's hard to say, but I think that the organizers will err on the side of caution here and they'll say, you know, it's not, it's not worth putting the event together. It takes too long. It's too much money. Um, we're not going to run the risk that we'll have to shut it down or cancel it. So that's my guess is the really big things won't happen, but there will be smaller scale events that, uh, you know, they'll be a little bit more exclusive. They'll be a little harder to get into because uh, ticket sales will be so limited. But uh, I, I think there will be plenty of uh, events. It might, might be more of them in number because they have to cater to smaller crowds. So instead of having one day with a thousand people, maybe you know, they'll do five days with 200 people, you know? Yes, or maybe even smaller parties. And from what I hear, the Hamptons is ready. Now, the Hamptons have always been coined as the playground for the rich and famous. And so what about the rest of people? I understand and I know that many people have truly suffered during this pandemic. And we have uh, several uh, food pantries here in the Hamptons. And people often forget that Many people are out of work, and despite this being the playground for the rich and famous, that poverty exists. And as town supervisor, what have you done to work with these people and to make sure that everyone has their family fed and that they have a roof over their head? Right. Well, Jean, thank you for that question. I think people forget that there is a year round working class um, community here in the Hamptons. And um, and that makes it possible for all these people who come out here in the summertime and, um, you know, for them to have a great time here. You know, somebody is cutting their hedges, somebody is washing their toilet bowls, somebody is bussing their tables when they go out to dinner, um, somebody is fixing their automobiles, some, you know, somebody is paving the roads, you know, all of these things. And somebody is going to drive the ambulance if somebody has a heart attack and somebody else is going to resuscitate them. So we have an incredible year round, kind community, hardworking community that doesn't share um, the economic fortunes as some of the summer crowds do. Though there's plenty of lots of year round successful people, but we have a the average income here is actually less than most other places on Long Island because it's so seasonal, yet the cost of living is higher. And so we've had a terrible time with, uh, with creating affordable housing, very challenging, and businesses have a hard time finding workers because they can't pay them enough to live in our area. So the pandemic uh, hit people really hard. A lot of restaurant workers in the beginning, the restaurants were all closed. A lot of people who 
have jobs related to special events. Maybe they set up tents or folding chairs, or maybe they're a disc jockey or even a musician. They were all out of work. We saw our food pantries quadruple in demand almost overnight where people, some people who used to donate to the food pantries were finding themselves online at the food pantries. And so you asked one of, you know, what, what are some of the things that I've done? And um, right from early on, I uh, worked to put together a group to raise money for the food pantries. We called it AFTI, uh, All for the East End. Um, I worked with Assemblyman Field to basically bring back a organization that had maybe five or six years ago had been put together. So all the, the groundwork was done. I wanted something where we could raise money for all of the food pantries at once. Because, you know, people, let's say, live in some of the richer areas like East Hampton Village or South Hampton Village. If they want to help their workers, they really need to understand that their workers probably don't live in those communities. So uh, somebody who's working in East Hampton might be living in Hampton Bays or Riverhead or, or a place called Riverside or Flanders uh, or East Quag, all these communities. So um, we put this organization together and pretty quickly we raised over a million dollars. And I'm not even sure how far past a million we've gone, but I think significantly past a million dollars. And that money went directly to support these food pantries. So uh, it was a great, great success, and uh, I'm sure still needed. So, and then we've done all kinds of other things, everything that the town can do to assist in social services, counseling, mental health counseling, and all kinds of different ways that we've been trying to assist our community. And now we just literally, if the federal government passed this uh, American Rescue Plan, and in it, there are millions of dollars that are gonna to come to the town to help further address some of these issues, to tr try to help some of those businesses and individuals who are impacted by, uh, by the coronavirus pandemic. So uh, we have a lot more to go. We wanna see our economy come back really strong, really strong. And you know, I wanna be a part of that. And how much is Southampton getting uh, from the stimulus plan? So, up until now, we have gotten nothing. And we have run up a great, you know, really a, a great deal of expenses. You know, a lot of police overtime, code enforcement. We had enforced all of the guidance that was coming out of New York State. Restaurants had to be 50% and close at 10 o'clock at night. Gatherings had to be limited to 10 people. So we've been super busy. We had to modify every workspace. We lost a ton of money in building permits because Building had to stop. There was a pause, uh, extended pause. We lost, the courts had to shut down. We lost all those justice court fees. So we had tremendous expenses and we lost a tremendous amount of revenue. So we have been asking, and I chair something called the East End Supervisors and Mayors Association. And uh, we as a group have been asking for help throughout. This is the first time we're getting it. Now, how much are we getting? That is not clear. Um, I want to say it'll be somewhere around $6 million. It's a, it's a decent amount of money. Uh, it'll go a long way in addressing those shortfalls. And I think we'll have some money in addition to help some of the businesses and the people who have been hurt the most to sort of stimulate our economy and do some projects that will help uh, protect public health and also help our local economy. So, uh, if we finally, our, our calls have been answered. I'm, I'm very excited about that. We're finally gonna see some money. We haven't seen it yet, but it'll, it, it'll be here soon. All very important. And as I know to our audience, we are with Jay Schneiderman. He's the town supervisor of Southampton. We are discussing the pandemic and its effects on Southampton. And I just want to say one word to all of our first responders, to all the people in the town of Southampton and in the entire end and then in the entire United States. Thank you very much. You've been amazing and we will fight this all together. And for all of those who are suffering from food insecurity, we are behind you. Just because the pandemic ends does not mean that 
problems go away automatically. Help will continue. And I know my family were very involved in supporting Heart of the Hamptons. We'll continue to do that. A food pantry that services the people of South Hampton who've lost jobs. And getting back to Jay, Jay, um, what advice do you give to young people now? Maybe they've lost a job, they've been furloughed. What can they do now? It's a hard time. And are, are there programs or are there job opportunities in, in the town of Southampton? Well, the, the town does hire. And we're always looking for good people and they have to go through the human resources office. Um, but just go to the town's website and they can look that up. They'll find that pretty quickly. Um, but there's going to be a lot of jobs this summer. I, and anyone who can't find a job um, isn't looking because the economy is going to come back roaring. Um, the rentals are through the roof already. Um, you know, businesses are gearing up. Uh, people are saying it could be like the roaring 20s out here. Um, there's a lot of people coming out to to the Hamptons to really relax and have fun. And those people are gonna demand services. And uh, I don't think there'll be any problem with employment. The biggest problem as always will be housing. But, um, you know, I think this is somebody just has to put themselves out there if they're looking, you know, it depends on what their skills are. And it's unfortunate because, you know, we don't have jobs in all employment type of areas. We're basically a summer resort area. So if somebody is a biotechnician or something or computer uh, coder, um, you know, they might not find the kinds of things that, they, that they're looking for. They might have to go to a larger city. But what we do have here is ex extraordinary trails, extraordinary beaches, uh, you know, uh, recreational opportunities. It's an amazing place to live in a tight knit community. Um, you know, so I think it's, you know, people might not have be able to do exactly the job that they went to college for or grad school for, but they might find a different type of employment that um, they can certainly make a career out of. And we have amazing craftsmen out here, cabinet makers, masons, um, carpenters who, uh, you know, easily find work. In fact, uh, I don't know if there's ever been a better time for those who are in construction and the real estate market is, I've never seen anything like it. Uh, the amount of real estate activity is uh, the highest we've ever seen. So, uh, you know, the, the economy is definitely coming back strong and there are definitely, definitely uh, employment opportunities for people. Well, this is, this is very exciting to hear because we need jobs and we need opportunity for all of our people. And Jay, what advice do you give to a young person about education, about getting going in this life? I don't know much about your education other than I think I read that you were educated in New York State and, and you've taken your career and you've given it uh, to the people of our country really by being so involved in politics. Also understand that you're a businessman. And if you want to talk a little bit about your business, I'd love to hear. So those are two questions. So to young people, I, I always say, follow your heart, do what you love. So, I mean, it, it's good to make money. I believe you'll find the money if you do what you love, but you know, I would hate to spend all of my time not liking what I did. I happen to love public service. It's so rewarding and, you know, I'm paid for it, but it's the inner rewards. When I, you know, am involved with creating a park somewhere and I see a family, you know, walking through a park or sitting on a bench or at a picnic table and, you know, listening to each other and sharing. And, you know, there's nothing that like makes me feel better than feeling like I've affected somebody's life in a positive way. So, you know, even just walking down a sidewalk that I, you know, helped fund and put into place uh the, you know those little those little things you know we've, we're building a new uh a senior center in west hampton that's exciting too and one day i'll go there and i'm sure i'll see lots of people sitting there having meals or you're playing games and and that's going to feel really good so i i love that so that's sort of my advice is to do what you love so that you know you're not resenting or regretting any of the time that you're spending you know, it just feels, 
you wake up every morning and you look forward to going to work. I think that's more important than, you know, how many dollars per hour you make. So, um, so that was, I think that was one part of your question. The other part had to do with me. So um, I studied chemistry in college. That was, that was my major uh, with a math minor. I never thought I'd go into to, uh, government at all. It was, I was active. You know, if I, if I saw something I didn't like, I, you know, was definitely active in college as a community type of organizer. Um, I came out to Montauk where I was born and uh, I started getting involved in environmental issues. And um, I, started, uh, I started working at a hotel and then managing hotels. I, I built up a pretty good business running hotels. And uh, I got this kind of crazy notion at one point to run for office. I, nobody thought I'd get elected, but I did. I became East Hampton Town Supervisor. Um, this was before I was South Hampton Supervisor. I was East Hampton Town Supervisor. Um, I did a few terms before I got elected to the Suffolk County Legislature, uh, where I represented the South Fork and Shelter Island. Um, I became Deputy Presiding Officer there. I was reelected uh, six times and then decided I had moved in that you know, while I was a legislator, I had moved to Southampton and uh, I decided to run for Southampton supervisor. And uh, apparently I've been told that, that no other person in New York State has ever been elected supervisor of two different towns. So it's kind of an interesting distinction. But I do, I really love what I do. I really feel like I can make a difference. So, uh, you know, I certainly get up every morning and look forward to the work that I do and uh, makes it and all well. And that's wonderful. And obviously you do a good job as town supervisor, Thank You're you. town supervisor in East Hampton and Southampton. And Jay, we've run out of time and I want to thank you very much. Today's guest, Jay Schneiderman, town supervisor of Southampton. I'm Jean Schafferoff, your host. I'll see you next week.